Hello and welcome to Guiding Assets, the flagship investment podcast for CFA Institute. I'm Mike Wahlberg, and today on the show, we have Kim Curtis, President and CEO of Wealth Legacy Institute, and the best-selling author of both Money Secrets, Keys to Smart Investing, and Retirement Secrets. Today's episode is a shorter one, as we're focusing on a single tactic for deepening relationships with an understanding of wealth, wealth management clients. Many people listening to this episode will be familiar with the concept of KYC, or Know Your Client. It's a set of rules that governs financial advisors by setting minimum standards for understanding the lives and circumstances of your clients to help you build an appropriate portfolio for them. KYC docs generally follow the arc of questions a portfolio manager might go through with a new client, confirming things like marital status, income, other family circumstances, investment time horizon, risk metrics, return objectives, and so on and so on. But what we're going to talk to Kim about today at Genogram is like a KYC form, but on steroids. Welcome to the show, Kim. Oh, thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. So Kim, why don't you start us off, just tell us what a genogram is and, and what it aims to do. Yeah, I'd love to share that, especially when we think about a genogram in the estate planning, legacy planning context, because it originally came out of the healthcare profession when practitioners graphically depict the health of the client or the patient so that when a doctor comes in or any other medical practitioner can graphically see the history of the client that looks for addiction issues through generations or obesity or other types of things uh, that clinicians can use. And so I took that concept and moved it to estate planning. Because when you think of as we create structures to eliminate taxation or pass money to other generations, what we miss as much as we want to create a structure that does that is oftentimes we miss the family human dynamics and whether they can handle that structure. For generations not even born yet. So what kind of things are on this graphical depiction? Can you, can you walk us through just an example of what one might look like for a new client? Yes. For the listeners, when you think of family tree, so structurally it's graphed like a family tree. So some of the conventions are a square for a male, a circle for a female, and then through generations, the oldest is on the left and the youngest child is on the right. And so as you plot family structure, you begin after doing that up and down, grandmother, great-grandmother, as far back as we can go or remember, and then children and grandchildren. And so at a minimum, it's at least three generations. And once you plot family structure, you then begin to ask different questions around relationships and functional issues of the family. So give us an example of what some of those, the digging that you do in that point to, to, to flush out the detail of the family. Yeah, so, so once you plot family structure, you then begin to document family information. And so some of that, first it's demographics. Where did, like immigration, and when did immigration happen in terms of your great-grandparents or otherwise? And then also it's a date of death, divorce, geographic location, occupation, educational level. And then after you do demographics, you then move to functional information. And functional information is really about health and emotional um, functioning in terms of direct family members. And then you drop to more critical family structure or events or transition events in a family. So that could be a death of a t particular person. It could be a job loss. It could be a divorce. It could be the loss of a child. And some of those events actually work through generations and begin to see patterns. And that's really the ultimate that you're trying to achieve as you do as you document family information. You then ask bigger questions around that as things unfold, like what are the core family values? Uh, what is your role in the family? What are the strengths and struggles of the family? And it kind of builds out. And then who controls the money? And, and how are spending decisions made? So you kind of build out as you get more and more information. And then ultimately, you do begin to see patterns around family relationships, family structure, and family rules and norms and understandings with behavior. So it gives you a, a, a more holistic view of the family and, and, and how your client might fit into that. And I feel like it it's really helping you to have a better idea of kind of what the risk profile is for, you know, for this, for this person beyond saying, you know, I want to retire in 30 years and I have this amount of income right now. Perhaps you have 
you know, uh, you know, a family member who is dependent on you due to, you know, recurring addiction issues, or you have mental health issues in the family. And so, so you might have people who are dependent on you, or perhaps that your client is dependent on others. And so can you talk a bit about that, about kind of how those inner, inner relationships inform the, the, the planning that happens? Yeah. When we think as portfolio construction, traditionally, when we think about risk profiles, um, it's really what the fa family can handle in terms of the portfolio. And we often miss the larger perspective as to what really that in means in terms of capacity and capacity beyond what some of what some practitioners think of as the financial plan capacity. Capacity is actually much broader than that because it takes into consideration not only generations past, but generations not even here yet. You know, I, I think of my uh, Native American culture, the elders, when they meet for tribal meetings, they actually do a blessing. And in that blessing, they talk about when, before they make decisions, make sure that they bring in their ancestors before them. And also the generations not born yet, as they make decisions as a, as a tribal uh, elders for the extended tribe. And I think, think about that as practitioners. If we could think beyond the person or couple in front of us or family, how much greater the outcomes would be. Yeah, the, the seven generations concept I think you're describing. Absolutely. I love that. One of the concepts you and I have talked about before is this idea of a sort of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, where the actual management of financial assets sits as the base layer, sort of the raw horsepower that's necessary to make it all go. And on top of that, you then have planning, lifestyle, all the way up to a self-actualization. I'm interested in how a genogram tangibly affects what happens in the plan. What can you, what can a genogram tell us about risk? And how might the findings from a genogram influence the asset mix that you might choose for a client? Sure. When I when I think of going through a genogram of client A and client B, let's hypothetically say client B has uh, has really interesting money behaviors. It could be that they have money myths that have been transferred from their grandfather or their great grandfather as a business owner that felt like any who lost his business, and that loss of that business transferred into fear of other types of trusting others. Those behaviors sometimes go through generations. And so if we understand that, say, portfolio B family has these money myths that have come through generations, that it helps us either identify and question what those are to kind of expose them so that one can get past it, or it'll, it, identifies that that's a red flag that we need to be careful with as it relates to um, passing to next gen. So when we think of generational transfers, oftentimes we take for granted certain things that, that when someone turns a certain age at 21, that they put the trust into the parent's name and make it a revocable trust. But what if that young child says, no, I'm not doing this anymore, even though culturally her siblings did it ahead of her? What happens is when this young person says, I'm not doing this, this is my money, then all of a sudden you may have a fractured relationship between siblings. And that fractured relationship carries on in the success of the next generational transfer. So when we think of A, very simple money issues coming along, what is the risk profile associated with that from a portfolio perspective? On each of them, it may seem relatively simple, but when you add the next layer of functional aspects and the family dynamics, all of a sudden the risk profile becomes much greater. And then what would you do differently as you design those structures beyond portfolio construction? I'm like when you said about the, the pyramid and we were talking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, kind of like, you know, you have food, clothing, shelter at the bottom and self-actualization at the top. I mean, we look at our structure, if we had that same pyramid and four steps in that pyramid, the bottom, as you said, is managing money. That's why people come to us more often than not initially. The next step in that four step is, is the financial plan. And you need them both tied together because otherwise portfolio construction and rate of return is irrelevant without knowing how it fits into the plan. And then that third one is what you mentioned was lifestyle. So lifestyle is, the, is that peace of mind. And if we can get families to peace of mind by integrating the financial plan with the portfolio, then all of a sudden they have a chance to breathe. And when they have a chance to breathe, that pinnacle for us is impact. 
for legacy. So it's like, finally, they have a chance to kind of get off the grind and live their life of their dreams, that ideal life and perfect calendar. And if we can get individuals and families and couples to impact, then we've done our job. And it's not where they are today as well as it's more the legacy of their children and grandchildren and beyond. So I imagine it can't be comfortable for you, for your client and possibly you to, to start and execute this this type of a process. <laughs> How do you warm clients up to this type of conversation? And, and who's in the room? Yeah. Boy, you know, everything that we do, we do. I make sure that I've done it myself to know the emotional feelings around that as you ask the questions. So I do know when it feels uncomfortable sometimes based on myself going through it. I think when you're just plotting the family tree, it, it's easy and they're into it to the extent of what they know. And then you just ask more interesting questions like, oh, where did they immigrate from? Oh, who was the first to go to college? Oh, tell me more about, are you more like your mom or your dad? Oh, tell me more about why. What are the values that you saw come through generations? So it actually becomes more of an interesting conversation that they really want to talk about than, say, the addiction issues that perhaps come up without them realizing they're talking about it. Well, we're coming to the end of our chat here this morning, Kim. I'm going to ask you our final two-part question here. And I know that you you spent many years in this industry. So I'm, I'm curious what your first job was in the industry. And if you could go back and take yourself for coffee on your first day, what key piece of advice would you offer yourself? <laughs> Mike, I forgot what we talked about when we first had this conversation. And I remember having an immediate answer. But I think I'm going to say today, if it's the same, you'll tell me or not. But I, I think it's get out of the way and let the people around me grow and lead because everything is happening so fast in terms of fintech and other types of things that to allow young professionals to really take a step in and add to the conversation just makes for better outcomes. And I love the fact that we're in this midst of fintech and disruption and finance. And I look forward to see what a decade from now may look like. I've been speaking today with Kim Curtis author and president and CEO of Wealth Legacy Institute. Thanks so much for chatting with me today, Kim. Thanks, Mike. Happy to be here. I'm Mike Wahlberg, and this is me, Guiding Assets. Mm-hmm.